Hello, and welcome to the module on economic and hydrologic modeling. In this first part of the module, I will introduce the concept of a model and present some examples of models that economists and hydrologists use to better understand the world we live in. The world model has several definitions but usually it refers to some sort of simplified representation of reality. And so let's go through a couple examples of what the word model can refer to. One possible definition for the word model is a small object, usually built to scale, that represents in detail another often larger object. So in this picture, on the left, we have a model car and this model car is a model because it is not as large as a real car it does not have the same functionality as a real car but it nevertheless gives us a pretty good idea of what a car is what the different parts of the car are and in this case we even see what is inside of a real car so again it is a smaller and simplified version of a real car Another kind of model that we often see is an architectural model. These are models that architects and des building designers use in order to uh, get a sense of what a building will look like once it is built in the real world. And again, this is a model because although it may have the same shape and the same relative proportions of the building that will be built, uh, it is not going to have all of the details that the real building will have. For example, uh, this model probably doesn't have the uh, individual bricks that will be part of this building. Or uh, perhaps these trees are not going to be exactly the same as the kind of trees that will, be built, uh, that will be planted next to the real building. So again, it is a representation of reality, but it is still very useful for an architect to have in the design phase. Another kind of model that we are used to seeing is that of a fashion model. And again, fashion models are representations of reality in that the clothes that they wear are probably not the clothes that they wear on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but by wearing them, models can give us a pretty good idea what these clothes will look like uh, on us. Okay, so again, they, they represent the real person that will be wearing these clothes, the people who will be purchasing these clothes. Now, in economics, a model is a simplified framework designed to illustrate complex processes that determine the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. So in the real world, which is made up of millions of individuals and tens of thousands of firms, and producers actually illustrating and representing all of the processes that go on in the economy is basically impossible. So economists who try to study the behavior of individuals and firms use models, simplified versions of these complex processes in order to get an understanding of how individuals behave and how firms behave. Likewise, in hydrology, a hydrologic model is a simplified conceptual representation of a part of the hydrologic cycle. Again, a hydrologic system in the real world, world will have many moving parts. It is going to be extremely complicated if you think about all of the different rivers, all of the different aquifers, precipitation, infiltration, discharge all the processes that are involved in a hydrologic system. Thinking about them all um, and quantifying them all would be close to impossible. So hydrologists also use simplified uh, versions of these real hydrologic systems in order to start getting an understanding of how they work. So in summary, economic and hydrologic models tend to omit many details of the systems that they look at. Okay, they don't include every feature of the economy or every feature of a hydrologic system, but by simplifying reality, these models can help us improve our understanding of the world. 
This brings me to a quote that is fairly well known and is attributed to the statistician George Box. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And what this quote means is that models aren't going to be able to represent exactly what happens in the real world, but they can be useful for us to understand what is going on in the real world. So now let me provide some examples of economic models. The first model, and this you may have heard of before, is a demand curve. A demand curve is a curve that we draw on a set of axes that is made up of price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. And there's going to be a downward sloping curve in order to represent the fact that in general as the price of a good goes down the quantity demanded of that good will go up. Okay, And that is a pretty good assumption to make about the behavior of individuals and their demand for goods and services. As the price goes down uh, the quantity demanded of that good or service will go up. Now again this is a model because there are probably many other things that determine an individual's demand for good or service. Um, and in some cases, in some special cases, this downward sloping relationship of the demand curve may not hold for some very undesirable products. Uh, even if that product is incredibly cheap, uh, you may not actually increase your demand for it. Okay? But in general, uh, this gives us a pretty good representation of what people do uh, in terms of their demand for a good or service when they see the price. Now this is a diagrammatic representation of the demand curve but economists also use equations to represent the demand curve. Here on the right side of this slide we have a um, an equation that represents the demand curve where Q is the quantity demanded of a good or service and P is the price of the good. Okay, And as you can see, if the price of this good goes up, because it has this minus term in front of it, the quantity demanded for that good will go down. So it is explaining the exact same relationship that this curve is, but only in the form of an equation. Another popular example of a model from economics is the circular flow diagram. And what the circular flow diagram tells us is not uh, in contrast to the demand curve which explains the behavior of an individual. Uh, the circular flow diagram explains what is happening in the economy as a whole. And so in the economy what this model is telling us is that there are businesses and there are households and there is a flow of money and a flow of factors and goods and services that move in opposite directions. Okay, so for example, um, for households, households will provide consumption expenditures. Okay, so this is money that they spend in return for the goods and services that were paid for by those expenditures. These goods and services are transacted in the product market. Businesses, in return, will provide those goods and services in the product market and they will receive the revenue from the consumption of the households. Okay. Businesses in order to produce these goods and services will need factors of production such as labor, land, and capital and will pay for those factors of production as costs into a different market known as the factor market and those factors in the factor market are provided by households and households are compensated for those factors with income such as wages or rents and interest. So this is a diagrammatic model and again it is a simplified version of a real economy. Uh, for example uh, many countries will also import and export goods uh, to other countries but those imports and exports are not shown in this particular model. This model uh, abstracts from imports and exports. Uh, a lot of economies also have governments as a large part 
of the economy and you don't see any governments here in this flowchart as well. So again, uh, it is a simplified model of a real economy, but it is still useful to understand uh, what happens between businesses and households. Here's an example, not from economics, but from physics. We're going to look here at uh, models that describe how uh, objects fall due to gravity. Okay? And these models are known as equations for a falling body. And one of these equations is this one right here, which gives us the distance traveled by an object, which is falling for a period of time t. Okay, and the relationship between the, the time that an object is falling and the distance that it falls is dependent on this constant g, which as many of you may have learned in science class is generally equal to 9.8 meters per second every second, which is the acceleration due to gravity. Yeah. So with this model, we can figure out, for example, if we drop a ball for a certain period of time, how far it will travel in terms of vertical distance. However, again, this is a simplification of reality. Uh, if you read carefully, about the description of this model, you will find out that uh, the model is accurate only if air resistance is ignored. Okay, so this only applies in situations where air resistance is minimal or non-existent. And g, the acceleration due to gravity, does not change with the height of the fall. So, for example, this equation will not be particularly accurate if we are thinking about a feather as a falling object. Uh, why? Because the air resistance between a feather and the atmosphere is fairly high. And um, as you would um, uh, have probably seen in real life, a feather falls much slowly than uh, different ob kind of objects, such as a cannonball, that would have much less air resistance. So this model makes certain assumptions about the real world, in particular that there is no air resistance and that G does not change. And so it is not 100% accurate, but again it does give us a good idea of how objects fall uh, close to the center of the earth and where air resistance is not a huge factor. So I, know, I hope you got a pretty good idea of what a model is and how economists and hydrologists use models. Um, in summary, uh, economists and hydrologists make appropriate assumptions and build simplified models you know, to understand the world around them. And models uh, can consist of different kinds. They can be physical models, they can be mathematical models, they can be diagrams, they can be computer simulations. So, Let's leave you with an exercise. Um, the tasks of this exercise are first, write down a model that you have learned about in one of your classes. This will probably be either in, in one of your science classes or maybe in a social science class. But a model, just like the examples that uh, I provided earlier, uh, the demand curve and the circular flow diagram or the um, equations for falling objects. Okay, but uh, pick your own example, and then once you've picked that example, try to answer the following questions about that model that you chose. First of all, what is the process or phenomenon that your model describes? Okay. So, for example, in the case of the demand curve, the phenomenon that it is trying to describe is the quantity demanded of a good based on its price. Second question, um, how does your chosen model simplify the way a process or phenomenon occurs in reality. Okay, so again, all models are simplifications of complex processes, processes in the real world, and this is going to be the case for the model that you choose, and so you want to identify what are the simplifications that have taken place in developing the model that you chose. And then you want to think uh, about a situation in which the model that you chose is likely to be accurate in representing reality. Okay, so for example, with the uh, equation for fallen objects that I talked about earlier, 
uh, it is probably likely to be accurate in representing the distance traveled by a cannonball that is falling due to the force of gravity. And the last question is, describe a situation in which your model may not be accurate in representing reality. So again, in the case of the equation for falling objects, um, that equation is probably not very good at describing how a, uh, a feather would fall due to the force of gravity.